Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, in the case of people from my side of the world, good morning, or persons even further east, good, after, good evening. Good day. My name is Jani Vremi, and I am most pleased to welcome you to this session on trade integration and policy, policy coherence. We have with us today four amazing panelists. Our panelists presentation will draw from research that they are conducting under the umbrella of the EU Horizon 2020 Framework Research Project, RESPECT. More information is available on the EUI RESPECT tab, the tab of the EUI uh, website. But let me start with introductions of our speakers very briefly to give you a sense of what this wonderful session is going to cover and their PowerPoints will be available on a dedicated website after, after they've done their presentation. I'm going to start in the order in which our panelists will appear. I have to introduce first Mr. Miklos Koren, Professor of Economics at the Central U European University. And Miklos will talk about his research on trade and investment similarity between EU member states and the EU average. The theme here is really the trade and investment policy coherence between EU member states and the EU as a whole. And he'll talk about using new data, uh, how patterns of trade affect incentives to engage in economic diplomacy. Next, we will hear from Kamala Dawar, Senior Lecturer in Commercial Law at the University of Sussex. She will be speaking about the need for a more coherent policy in the EU medium to long term in the area of official export credit support. Following um, Dr. Dawar, um, we will hear from Mr. Laszlo Bruce, Professor Bruce, excuse me, who is a professor of political science at the Central Universe, European University and Columbia University. And he will present his research on convergence between um, or toward EU trade related norms and policies in neighborhood countries and the factors of change in labor standards based partly on a quantitative study and on two case studies in the EU southern and eastern neighbors, Morocco and Moldova, with specific attention to questions related to coherence or the absence thereof. And finally, we will hear from Dr. San Balal, Senior Executive and Head of Programming at the ECDPM. He will speak about coherence between trade and development policy at the EU. And his presentation is going to draw from two recent papers that he has presented under the RESPECT umbrella. So we have a wonderful lineup for you. Um, I'm not even, I'm really excited to hear from them in this area that's relatively new for me and such dedicated focus on the RESPECT really one thing that we will probably learn a lot from as we try to replicate that approach in other regions like mine in the Caribbean. Each presenter will speak for between 12 to 15 minutes. I'll keep them to time so that we can have enough time for interaction with the audience in the final 30 minutes of the session. For those listening to the event um, on the Zoom function, I will ask you please to write your questions in the dedicated chat function at the bottom of the platform um, that you can see um, before you. And at the end, I will try to collect the questions and present them to the speakers. So without further ado from me, let me turn over to our first speaker, Mr. Miklos Kor, uh, Professor Miklos Koran, who will take you away with his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be part of this panel and uh, talk about this ongoing research. So this is actually based on work we have been doing with Gabor Berei, Matteo Fiorini, Filippo Santi and Gergő Zavet. Um, and basically what we are trying to do in this broader project is to think about the difference in trade policy between EU member states. And you might uh, have the first reaction that I put on this slide as well. There is none because trade policy is decided at the union level and so not at the member state level. 
But we actually want to go a little bit deeper and think about the economic incentives and, and the different attitudes of member states and how they relate to other uh, third countries in their trade integration and what other incentives they might have. So this is very much a data-driven project. Let's explore what member states are doing. And instead of just saying, well, there is no difference between member states, let's look at the data and, and see uh, what kind of differences we might tease out. And the, um, the kind of data sets, let me say a few words about the kind of data sets that we have collected and that we have in mind for this analysis. So first of all, as I mentioned, we're gonna focus on differences between EU member states and in particular, how they relate to uh, third countries. And we want to focus on, on, uh, on kind of an interesting subset of third countries. We want to focus on um, candidate and potential member countries or, or European neighborhood policy uh, countries, whether Eastern or Southern, um, and, and look at the bilateral relationship between, uh, between these pairs of countries. But what are we measuring when we are looking at the relationship? So we're going to look at actual trade flows, uh, exports and imports between these pairs of countries from COMEX data. We do collect these, these trade flow data at the product level, the harmonized system six digit level to be able to compare what countries are exporting, not just how much. And we're going to look at standard um, indicators that predict trade flows. So the size of the country that comes from the world development indicators, um, geographic distance and other uh, distance like indicators from SAPI. And these, these are kind of standard measures in, in, in trade analysis. But what I would like to draw the attention to um, is what is probably more new to this analysis. There's one data set that we are relying to is called GDAD, Global Database of Events, Language and Tone. And so this is um, basically a data set of media mentions, um, updating the data set every 15 minutes, real-time collection of, of uh, media mentions in, in a lot of different media outlets of various um, events. And we're going to focus on events related to um, state visits or, or signing economic agreements. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but this is some way of, of measuring cooperation between pairs of countries. It's to look at what is, what is getting picked up in the media. Another um, measure we're going to use is how similar are our uh, country's voting patterns in the United Nations. And this would actually be fascinating to do in uh, in the European context um, as well, but so far we have followed some political science literature and looked at the UN General Assembly voting patterns to see how similarly aligned are our countries when it comes to the global arena. And we also look at um, people's attitudes on trade and EU trade policy in the Euro barometer data. So um, what type of measures have we have we developed? As I, as I mentioned, GDELT, this media mentioned database is gonna be crucial for our analysis. And in there, we're going to use two measures. One is what we call intent. Um, so you can, and, and we're going to count the number of intents by, by year. And the average country pair has two such events being recorded. And the way to think about it is that if a minister um, makes a media appearance and makes a speech about what they want to do with another country, you know, you know, we are willing to sign an agreement or we are entering negotiation, that's an intent. Okay, so that's going to be bumping up our measure by one. Um, the other measure is going to be visits. It's a little bit broader than visits, but just um, we abbreviate it as visits. So uh, these would be actual state visits. Um, going from one, so one representative of a government agency going to another country or hosting someone from another country, or it would be signing a formal agreement. Um, so, so formal negotiations, not just kind of talking about it, but when two parties meet would be captured in this, in this um, index. 
Then we have uh, kind of standard measures of, of that are typically used in trade analysis. Um, and this agreement index in, uh, in the UN General Assembly that I mentioned and differences in public opinion. I, I'll get back to these measures when I, when I can show you some, some results. Um, so the first thing to, to note is maybe not surprisingly, if we look at these media mentions, um, then actually these uh, intents and visits, they follow a gravity equation in the following sense, that if you, if you look at a pair of countries, I call them exporter and importer, even though now they're not really exporting and importing, they are hosting or they are hosting a visit or they are sending uh, a state official abroad. But the bigger, so let's focus on visits, for example, the bigger the ascending country and the bigger the receiving country, the more visits we're going to see mentioned in the media. And the farther these countries are, the fewer visits we're going to see. So there is some sort of gravity equation. Um, countries tend to cooperate with large countries that are nearby. So that's not, maybe not very surprising, but we wanted to validate this. This is of course very similar to how trade flows work. Interestingly, if we look at the full sample, then there is no positive correlation between the amount of trade that the country is doing and this, this other measure of, of what we call the economic diplomacy um, index. Now we focus on the, uh, on the country sample that I mentioned before. So EU member states on one hand and uh, and ENP um, countries, so kind of neighborhood countries on, on the other, on the kind of the receiving end of this economic, economic diplomacy. And we see, we want to see, you know, is it true that different EU member states behave differently towards these countries? And we can capture some differences between the EU member, member states. So here, interestingly, it shows that the more I trade with the, with the country, the more visits and, and the more I talk about that country and the more visits I have. So, you know, just a made up example here, if, if the Hungarian, Hungary trades a lot with Russia, then, um, then the Hungarian prime minister might talk a lot about um, cooperating with Russia. And so that would be picked up, that would be picked up here. Um, what I would also like to draw your attention to is that this um, index of how geopolitically aligned these countries are in the UN is actually very highly positively, very strongly positively correlated with their, with their state visits. Okay? So countries that are more aligned host um, uh, one another's actor, government actors more, more often. And if we look at the, you know, we want to dig a little bit deeper and we look at, you know, what is the, the differences in public opinion in the, in the two countries. Unfortunately, we can only do this for the EU member states, so not for the third countries. Um, and what we see is that indeed, the more dissimilar the countries are in, in terms of public opinion, how they think about globalization and trade, the less they interact in this economic diplomacy sphere as well. So it seems like there is some, some sort of, um, not only economic, but also the public opinion uh, aspect of determining these, these uh, economic diplomacy visits. And what we would like to do um, next, next is to link it to, um, to an index of trade similarity. So the idea being that Indeed, that looks like there are in incentives for countries to behave differently. And, and in you know, government actors speaking up and, and you know, going on state visits, they do behave differently, the different member states. And so we are trying to understand why that might be the case. And so one hypothesis is that the uh, com comparative advantage of the economy might be very different and if, if I have a comparative advantage that's very different uh, from the rest of the EU countries, I might have special uh, incentives to, um, to favor my export partners because I wanna make sure that I can sell my export products. And if I cannot do that via trade policy, um, I might be looking for other, other channels to do this. So in order to measure this, this um, difference or similarity in, in comparative advantage, we have created an index of trade similarity. And let me um, 
do a quick live demo of that index. So what that what that means. Um, so what we did is we uh, measured the product um, distribution of a country's export vis-a-vis -vis another country. And we asked, is this product composition different from what the rest of the EU is doing? So if, if this is something very special, if I'm only selling steam turbines to this country or, or wind turbines to this country and no one, is, no one else is selling wind turbines, then, then my country has a special incentive to behave differently from the rest of the EU. So that's the uh, idea behind behind this index. Um, and so we constructed this index in such a way on, on this website, you can also find the formula for the index and explore the different, uh, the values it takes for different years, but we have constructed it in such a way that it takes values between zero and one. Uh, one meaning that I am very similar to the rest of the EU. So if you look at, uh, and, and here, higher values are lighter uh, yellows. So you can see that Germany is very similar to the rest of the EU. And when we think of Germany as a core country, I think we're not, maybe not very surprised, but, um, but there are countries that, especially with some other partners, um, like the Czech, Czech Republic with Azerbaijan, just, just some random example, tends to have a different export portfolio than the rest of the EU. EU has. So these darker uh, shades mean more dissimilar export portfolio. So th this is probably where we should be uh, looking for extra incentives to deviate from, from, the common, um, from the common trade policy. So this um, data set we have only until 2017 so far, but we can, uh, with new Eurostat numbers, we can update this because it would be very interesting to see how the similarity changes as geopolitical events and other uh, trends are changing in the world. And we can explore um, the differences across countries. So that's uh, all I wanted to say. And this is very much ongoing research. So of course, we want to then connect back this uh, trade similarity index into the um, type of analysis we did with gravity equations before and explore that further. Um, and I would be very much interested in, in your thoughts about the research project. Thank you. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. I'm not an economist, so my, my mind is trying to like extrapolate uh, ultimately um, and some conclusions ultimately for EU negotiating policy from what your findings are unearthing already. But we'll get to that maybe in the Q&A. There may be more questions on the, the, the actual um, practicalities and, and specifics of the index quite apart from how to extrapolate. But you're right bang on time. So thank you for the interesting presentation within time as well. Can I now turn to Dr. Dewar, who is going to speak um, next? Thank you. And your, um, unfortunately, your mic is off. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here and to, um, present this research. What we were trying to do on this was <clears throat> to actually uncover some of the, the information behind export credit support um, because it's quite a non-transparent area. So 80% of uh, trade has to be underpinned by trade finance. So these are sort of loans and guarantees and insurance. And that is to cover the sale and safe delivery of, of a good or a service. Now, there's been a persistent trade finance gap of about 1.5 trillion in 2019. So if the commercial sector isn't able to support these uh, transactions, then the government often comes in with what's called an export credit um, agency. Now, so what I'm trying to do here is to find out more about how export credit agencies um, operate on the international market. Now, as a lender of last resort, the last 10 years have been quite uh, hectic for export credit agencies because we had the 2008 crisis, subprime uh, market crisis, um, and then we've had other crises before now with the pandemic. So this uh, chart is up until 2018, and you can say uh, that in the OECD countries, who are a member of the OECD arrangement, I'm which really is- I'm really sorry to interrupt you. Dr. Dewar, did you have a presentation that you wanted to upload? Can you not? See it? No, we're not seeing it. Oh, I'm seeing it. Sorry. 
Oh, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, there it is. You can oh, see it now. Wrong. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Sorry. So what I was trying to say here was um, there's been a lot of activity in the last sort of 10, 15 years, whereas the commercial sector was quite robust until the financial crisis. Um, we then saw a hike in... Um, in export credit support from OECD countries. And at the same time, we saw new um, providers coming in from the BRIC countries. Most notably here, we can see it's China. So by 2018, actually China in itself was, was almost rivaling the whole of the OECD countries uh, who were members of the part of the arrangement. Um, so it became actually kind of a competition between OECD participants and the new credit agencies who um, are not members of the OECD. So that's kind of what's been happening before the coronavirus. Now, the other thing that's been happening in, in order to com uh, compete with China, um, while having these kind of, uh, sort of soft law uh, constraints from the OECD arrangement, we found that even OECD um, export credit agencies have also been sort of recalibrating their, um, their products so that they fall outside the OECD arrangement. So what we can see here is <clears throat> the dark blue at the bottom is <clears throat> the, the transactions that were falling under the arrangement. And we can see that actually they've been declining and other activity has been increasing, such as DFI activity, investment support, <clears throat> untied support, market windows, and just unregulated export credits. So we have a regulatory problem as well as the transparency problem. Now, um, so not only are um, OECD participants having to up their game, but they're also having to change um, their products. So they're no longer regulated by the OECD, but they are regulated by the WTO, which we know is binding law under the Subsidies and Countervailing Measures Agreement. Now, not only have we been seeing more activity from official export credits because of these crises, economic crises, but the tariff war between the US and uh, China has also increased China's um, coverage even more. So we can see here that because of the tariff war, the total sum insured by Sinusure increased by 16.7% to $612 billion. The claims and payouts have increased and the recoveries have been down. So um, other things have been forcing China to up, up their support, but it's again, it's competing with other export credit agencies that fall under the OECD arrangement. Now, <clears throat> Then we have the pandemic and that's created even more crisis because um, the, again, the commercial sector has dried up in terms of providing um, financial liquidity. So uh, export credit agencies again have had to step up and we can see here, there isn't much evidence available at the moment, but what we have from the OECD surveys is that you can see that the OECD members have even more modified their terms and conditions and they've got even more working capital as compared to what happened in the 2008 crisis. So there's been more activity and it's more unregulated. And what do we do about this? So really a statement of the problem here of the research is <clears throat> what is the extent of this support? Why is on a transactional level, is it so difficult to find out exactly what is being covered and whether they're at market rates or not? Um, and is there, what we would call a subsidy war going on in the terms and conditions of export support rather than the quality and the price of the goods themselves. And that subsidy to war really comes at the cost of the public purse. And it also comes at the cost of due diligence, which is why we're seeing, uh, for example, sustainable development problems with some of this um, project support. And also why we're seeing more debt distress, for example, Zambia now is, <clears throat> is having to um, really face default. So this research now, the second tranche of this research is really trying to sort of break it down and find some information on a transactional level and also to try and um, look at provisions um, as compared to GDP, provisions as compared to exports, total exports, and try and get a bit more of a nuanced picture. But until the members agree to um, allow information um, to be publicly available, this is really under the radar and it's something, it's almost like a cartel of export credit providers. So I'll stop there. And um, oh, sorry, the last, maybe, maybe the last two minutes, we didn't see any screen from there you. Is, that, oh. that was it. There aren't, there aren't any more slides. Yeah. So really the statement of the problem is this non-transparent. This is probably a subsidy war. 
and because we don't know what's happening um, we can't actually monitor governance and accountability so thank you apologize for the with the abrupt beginning no no that was great well because you have literally like eight minutes left i'm gonna entertain the question in the chat to you um which i think is asking if you're implying or showing from the graph that the volume of chinese export credit is equal to that of other oecd countries combined i guess there's a clarification question there that that's right i'll just come back to the screen share um uh, so, where are we? So we, we can't, okay, great. So this was here. So what we can see is all of the OECD participant, participants, which is the EU member states, <clears throat> the US, Canada, Switzerland, Turkey, um, all together in 2018, they were providing just under 80 billion US dollars. Now, in 2018, just China alone was just under 40 billion. So this is the problem with the, uh, the actual volume of support that China is offering to its exporters um, on a medium long-term basis. But then, because we don't have very accurate figures, we can't really offset that against the size of the exports that China is providing. So there is more drilling down to do, but a lot of the problem here is actually finding the information because um, governments don't want to uh, share it, partly because of business confidentiality and partly because a lot of this might be non-compliant. I, I wonder if, if you can tell us the sources that you have been able to consult to construct your graph so far. Okay, so this is quite an interesting story as well. One of the best sources of information for this project has been the US uh, Exim reports, competitiveness reports to Congress. Now they, as you can see these charts are actually from them as well. Uh, the problem with this is that they aggregate different databases, so they use their own sources Exim, bilateral engagement, which is your guess is as good as mine, and they use OECD databases. Now these are all different databases that they bring together, so these are kind of guesstimates. The real issue behind this is because the US XM has not had for the past five years until 2019, they didn't have a mandate from Congress to renew their budget. They didn't have as much um, state resources available to them as other ECAs. So a lot of these US competitiveness reports are very political because they're trying to lobby Congress. And in doing that, they show quite um, perhaps a caricatured uh, situation so it's very much about us against china it's very much saying look all the european ecas they're doing much more than we are um, we need more money to compete and we need to change our our products as well so that they also fall outside of the oecd arrangement the problem is when they fall outside of the oecd arrangement there aren't the due diligence as well as the market um, benchmarks to kind of guide and ensure that this export support is not number one not a big subsidy raise and number two that there's sustainability and due diligence attached to a sort of debt distress so it's also the fact that we're becoming more unregulated even within the oecd ecas in in our attempt to be more innovative and, and bring new products to the table so for example we'll see here that uh, development of finance activity is supposed to be about poverty re reduction but actually it's becoming part of blended financing. So it's becoming more blurred as to when it's actually just supporting domestic exporters in their exports. So whether it's also primarily about poverty reduction, investment support, that also needs to be insured and guaranteed, untied support. So all of these products don't have the due diligence um, that we expect from the OECD arrangement. Now, to take the analysis a bit further, in the EU, the OECD arrangement has actually been transposed into um, EU legislation. So it's part of, it was part of the key. So actually it's binding. What was a soft law for the other OECD participants is actually binding for the EU. The problem there is that the evaluation of what happens at the EU level, um, at the EU member state level, is not undertaken very rigorously by the commission because they feel that they haven't got the mandate to demand um, 
full transparency and uh, coherent monitoring from the member states. So we have this tension. The EU has competence for common commercial policy. The EU member states actually provide the export credits and they are the ones who are competing and trying to make their domestic companies more competitive and get more markets in what's a fairly stagnant export market. So we have this sort of tension between wanting to abide by the framework and, and, and actually thinking, well, are we going to get any business if we don't kind of join the game of the other countries? So it's, it's a sort of um, a dilemma, a strategic dilemma. And what you can see from this is actually um, most export credit agencies are sort of moving away from OECD arrangement terms and conditions, um, which means it's more unruly. So the WTO becomes the main regulatory framework if the OECD is shrinking in relevance and scope. Uh, what do we know about WTO SEM? Well, it's bilaterally enforced, um, which means that there has to be a case between two parties that want to bring the case. Um, and also there's no monitoring of these export credits and transparency and notification is very patchy. So we have a sort of um, uh, gaps in not just the regulation, but we also have gaps in the enforcement, um, which, which also is a, is a real problem for just public resources and trying to prevent a subsidy uh, war. Really very interesting. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, so if I can move to Professor Bruce, I don't know if I'm getting that pronunciation correct, um, but, and your mic is off. <laughs> your mic, can you hear me? Your, your mic is off. Okay, can you hear me? I can Excellent. hear you. Thank you. So thank good, you. your pronunciation was just right. Uh, and uh, thanks so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm talking about a, a, a uh, research that already has a draft paper, but I don't present, uh, so, and we'll this thing, so those of you who might be interested uh, can get uh, the paper in a few weeks from now. Uh, but uh, uh, the, this is with uh, my uh, uh, colleagues uh, from CEU, what we explore is the relationship between trade integration and, uh, and non-trade related policy areas, uh, primarily uh, the focus is on uh, uh, labor standards. Uh, it's a broad uh, area ranging from uh, uh, abolishing uh, child labor or forced labor to uh, collective or, or uh, individual uh, labor rights uh, uh, and uh, to social dialogue. So it is a bit broad area and uh, uh, what we try to look at uh, in a quantitative way is what are the factors of change uh, in uh, uh, labor standards and labor rights, uh, then in, uh, what role, if at all, is played by uh, different EU policies. The, first of all, the, the membership in the uh, well, joining these European neighborhood policies. Then the quanti qualitative part, uh, the case studies, uh, what we try to express, what are the different actors doing and what, what, what role is played by EU, different member states, uh, 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 NGOs, transnational NGOs and then domestic players. And so we try to look at uh, more in both ways, these actors and factors. And then the third part of the question, which we, I believe it will touch upon, is the coherence uh, of this policy. So this is uh, the three things. So, uh, on the qualitative or the quantitative part. Uh, then uh, basically we use uh, uh, the worker rights index, uh, the CIRI index, it's called CIRI index, uh, which uh, uh, is a composite index, has uh, child labor, uh, uh, acceptable working conditions, uh, minimum wage, uh, uh, acceptable safety standards. It's a composite uh, uh, index. Uh, and that's uh, available for a very large number of countries. And then uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, how that changes uh, and what are the factors of uh, changing uh, in these uh, elementary worker rights. Now, uh, what uh, was uh, the, I just briefly said the most important findings. Uh, one is that the, 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 the primary economic factors shape change. Uh, 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 in uh, uh, labor rights, in improvement in labor rights. So we found two factors that uh, uh, are the most important one. Uh, uh, one is uh, the uh, share, increase in the share 
of export in uh, countries with higher labor standards. So we, here we check the working of the California effect. This is the, what is called also the race to the top. That is, if you export in uh, countries or increase trade with countries that with higher standards, then several actors and factors might uh, uh, be set in motion that push up uh, the standards uh, uh, in the less uh, developed country. And, and that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a robust uh, support uh, for this idea that is California effect uh, works. Uh, uh, actually, that's the strongest the predictor in change. The other economic factor that uh, plays an important role is uh, uh, the uh, quality of exports. So we look at uh, what is the share uh, of uh, uh, high-tech uh, tech uh, technologically more sophisticated export and what is the share of the uh, more low-end uh, textile export. Uh, and then uh, again what we find was uh, that uh, uh, the higher is the share uh, the, of, uh, of the tech export, uh, the uh, more positive uh, is the change in uh, uh, the uh, labor uh, rights uh, and uh, vice versa, uh, increasing the share of the textile export that stands for more low qual lower quality uh, uh, export, or lower quality inclusion into international trade, that uh, uh, actually decreases, it has a significant negative uh, relationship. Uh, so it means that uh, basically, uh, besides the California effect, the other uh, uh, thing is that in, in a uh, Williamsonian uh, uh, understanding that would be basically the specificity, asset specificity uh, of, of export, how it changes. If you go to, towards uh, uh, higher asset specificity, then that uh, has a positive effect uh, on uh, uh, the uh, labor rights, uh, whereas uh, uh, going to the lower end uh, uh, decreases. Uh, and. Uh, what is interesting, and that, that tells something about the type of actors, is that it is not uh, the FDI, uh, the increase in FDI, an increase in FDI stock uh, that changes, but the, just trade with the high end, uh, the, the countries with higher uh, uh, labor standards. So uh, actually, uh, increase in uh, uh, FDI stock uh, has a negative, uh, significant negative uh, effect. And finally, uh, ENP, membership in ENP, we use this ENP dum, uh, dummy, that has significant, not, not as robust as the economic variables, but it has uh, effect in change. Okay, going, moving fast to the case studies. There, uh, the question was uh, basically what kind of uh, changes happened uh, uh, and uh, what kind of actors played a role. Uh, now, one thing is what we found was that uh, most of the change happens on the books. Uh, and uh, a much smaller part happens on the ground. Uh, uh, so interaction of, of uh, uh, regulations and standards that meet uh, the criteria of high-end uh, or, or, or exporting or importing countries that, that have higher labor standards. Uh, so introducing uh, uh, higher quality regulations uh, to the books that happens, uh, uh, and that's uh, unambiguous, it happens in both countries, whereas on the ground the changes are very mixed, uh, it's, um, it's much more mixed. Uh, on the ground uh, uh, you have changed more on the most elementary uh, level of labor rights, meaning uh, uh, decrease uh, uh, of forced uh, labor, decrease of, lab of child labor. The, these are or all in uh, uh, not as strongly or in collective labor rights, uh, meaning union, uh, union rights. But this, this, is, this is it, but not on the other uh, types of uh, uh, labor uh, rights, like uh, changes in labor conditions, uh, minimum wage, working hours. Uh, so these are already qualitative, will be qualitative changes of labor uh, within the economy that uh, uh, does not happen uh, in neither in Morocco nor in in, in Moldova. Uh, in a way, one could say that uh, these uh, countries uh, uh, at least uh, are this is sort of a sign that they are integrated uh, uh, more in the low end uh, uh, of uh, 
of uh, development uh, that is uh, they basically get integrated with cheap and skilled uh, labor with minimal rights. Uh, now, uh, if you look at the different uh, actors, the EU, the EU. In the EU, the labor standards uh, issue is not a priority. Uh, we had several interviews on that. It was in Brussels and in the, in the uh, field from domestic actors. Uh, uh, and uh, there are few labor standards that matter for the EU, not the whole uh, uh, range, uh, more the most elementary labor standards. And uh, if you look at the, the assistance programs of EU, they are also very limited, uh, uh, more, uh, and not just limited, but they are either uh, to non-state actors or the state, but neither, uh, we didn't find any sign uh, of uh, more complex uh, assistance programs that would bring together into uh, developmental alliance, uh, uh, state and non-state actors. Uh, and then uh, we found some of the countries, some of the member states uh, are more active, those who are more engaged in uh, these markets, Belgium, France, uh, uh, Spain, they are basically that. What is interesting, uh, 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 non-EU actors, uh, uh, international organizations but were more uh, engaged uh, on the ground uh, in trying to improve uh, conditions like USAID uh, or ILO uh, than the EU. Uh, so basically what one can say that the EU in general in this uh, 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 policy area has very limited goals. Uh, and and these limited uh, goals go, uh, go hand in hand with uh, very limited uh, or negligible vertical coherence, uh, meaning uh, uh, across EU and member states, there is not much uh, coordination in this issue. Now, if you look at uh, uh, coherence across the policy areas, it means that it, it, with the, uh, these labor standards are closer to uh, and are linked more to human rights uh, considerations. So this is, this is, this is uh, in that uh, uh, there is a link and that's why it uh, actually explains why this is not linked to trade issues primarily, but it's linked to human rights issue and that's why uh, one can understand why uh, more, the more elementary forms of labor rights matter and not uh, any kind of uh, uh, complex uh, uh, arrangements. Uh, uh, so, uh, in a way, from this perspective, uh, uh, one can say that uh, the, there is a horizontal policy coherence at uh, EU in the sense that uh, it has very limited uh, uh, trade-related objectives uh, and it uh, they, they match with very limited uh, 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 labor standards objective. Yes? It's, uh, uh, the limitations, uh, and, that's, uh, and here this is the last point I would like to say, talk about, is uh, that the, the trade related, uh, uh, it's not just minimal, uh, but they are uh, primarily nominal, in nominal in the sense that uh, uh, what is interesting is to increase the quantity of trade. Uh, not much uh, uh, concern is linked uh, here in trade policies uh, to either the positive or negative developmental externalities of increased trade. That is, uh, uh, we didn't find signals in either of these countries that uh, EU would like either to maximize the potential longer term developmental gains uh, of increased trade or decrease the potential negative uh, consequences of trade. There's zero uh, uh, sign uh, for that. That means that uh, uh, that's a very qualified no, this quantitative approach uh, uh, to uh, trade integration uh, in which uh, developmental externalities, the positive or negative, uh, don't uh, uh, really matter. It means that, uh, that the, the why is that important? It's important because uh, uh, the more uh, complex uh, labor standards uh, uh, that are linked to uh, skill formation or uh, to uh, uh, working conditions or minimum wage and things like that. These, uh, uh, if they come up in these countries, they come up at the level of sectors. Uh, the players are primarily domestic trade unions, uh, business associations, and some of the reformers. Not uh, uh, a single sign of involvement of EU uh, in this kind of uh, engagement. So. Uh, in a way, comparing to, let's say, uh, to the Eastern enlargement, uh, uh, where the EU had 
and was forced to uh, consider some development, uh, not global, but some uh, development consequences, uh, you cannot find uh, uh, any signs uh, of uh, what is called bottom-up approach uh, to the trade integration, meaning the, this is a purely top-down, from the perspective of, of EU, is a purely top-down in which uh, 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 policies are transferred, there is some limited uh, assistance, but no uh, attempt to uh, join uh, development, uh, transnational development alliances with actors on the ground, either with the public actors, like in, uh, uh, in all the uh, uh, new member states, uh, the EU did uh, uh, form, for example, uh, units uh, within the state administration that had to consider the longer term development consequences of taking over. Uh, uh, EU standards, or with the uh, domestic actors, uh, meaning uh, uh, different kinds of economic actors. So, uh, in a way, uh, what I would say is that, uh, uh, based on that, that uh, the, the limited uh, 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 goals uh, in the trade integration policy uh, match uh, uh, the limited uh, outcomes uh, in the and change and ambitions of change uh, on labor standards. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor. I wonder if you could address, because we have a couple minutes left, um, one of the questions that came out of the chat, which is, can you explain, I guess, what you mean when you talk about higher as opposed to lower labor standards? Higher labor standards, the, 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 the more, I would say, more elementary labor standards, the more elementary labor standards are uh, 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 basically linked to uh, abolition of forced labor, uh, uh, child labor, uh, and uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, at least for the formation uh, of uh, trade unions. So these are the uh, most elementary forms. Uh, Higher end would be, for example, uh, consultations, involvement of, of, uh, of uh, uh, unions. Uh, uh, some of the member states actually were pushing, uh, like uh, Spain in Morocco, uh, for uh, dialogue, social dialogue between uh, unions uh, and, uh, and uh, business associations and government and developmental uh, issues. Then other uh, are labor conditions, uh, uh, health and safety conditions. These are more uh, more sophisticated. This is this means that uh, labor as an asset uh, uh, matters. Uh, uh, it's uh, these are these are this of course needs some investment, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which has costs. Thank you so much. And um, I I do have a question in the Q and A in case no one has about uh, how where you situate gender slash labor. Um, sort of concerns because labor is a broad church. You mentioned, you know, certain aspects of it, but the gender, I think the gender impact um, and how you measure that as part of a, a labor um, issue under trade and trade agreements. Maybe traditionally it's, it's dealt with separately because gender is appearing so much on mandates for trade negotiations. I wonder if, if that came into your thinking at all, but maybe we can address that if there are no questions from the audience in the Q&A, but I will leave that out there. Um, so finally, but by no means last, um, of an, in, in importance, can I ask um, Dr. Bilal to present on his topic, which I believe is, is coherence in, in development and development related um, components of, of policy. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be with you and, and participate to this very interesting discussion. Uh, indeed, our work focused more on, on the connections between the EU trade policy and, and its coherence with its development uh, policy. And I think at the outset, it's very important to, to mention that when the EU is uh, uh, dealing with developing countries and uh, the trade policy of the EU with developing countries is not just about trade policy objectives, but it's really also about development objectives and, and partly also increasingly to promote some of the EU values, including, including on human rights and, and sustainability uh, uh, questions. So that's in the design of, of the EU is, is to use also trade policy for, for, 
to achieve some, something else. So the question we ask is, uh, you know, what does it mean in practice and how has it been translated uh, into practice? And so there is here, I would like to start perhaps with some of the insights from uh, my friends at the University of Sussex that, that looked at more quantitative uh, analysis, trying to look at the alignments of the EU aid with its trade policy. And, and what they found is that there's stronger alignments of what the EU institutions uh, support uh, to, to, to trade uh, in terms of uh, what they do with the in potential and uh, future EU accession countries. Uh, and there's also stronger support and alignments for the app as in particularly when it's focused on sustainable development objectives. Uh, but that's for what the EU as, a, as an institution is doing. For the EU member states, then the picture is much more, more mixed. Uh, overall, they also found that the EU aid tend to be also more focused on sustainable development objectives uh, in the GSP plus countries than it is in GSP countries. So again, here, here there's you know, suggestion that there is some kind of alignment of if there's more higher requirement in terms of sustainability objectives in the trade policy with GSP plus, you receive more aid. And similarly, in uh, looking at EU FTAs, there's also uh, more EU environment related aid in countries uh, with deeper environmental provisions in the EU FTAs than, than otherwise. So there is some suggestion that uh, so some of the quantitative work uh, provides some suggestions that there is indeed some, some linkages. Uh, for my case uh, and with my colleagues, we, we focus more on the experience uh, that was quite interesting bit of the EU negotiating free trade agreements with the African, Caribbean and Pacific countries, these famous economic partnership agreements. And the reason we, we thought it was a good uh, it was a good entry point to focus on is because they, these negotiations have been framed uh, really as being development tools, and and so the objective of the EU was really to to help ACP countries uh, to achieve uh, development. At least that was the stated uh, official objectives. And you know, with the idea that these EPAs will help stimulate uh, domestic reforms in ACP countries, uh, they will uh, help foster and build on their regional integration dynamics and, and help build regional markets, uh, that it will also help the ACP countries to become more competitive uh, in their participation to the global economy, and that would also help their economic diversification. So in that sense, the, you know, you have a lot of elements of the trade policy is in itself not, and, and the objective was not to increase market share with the ACP. Uh, so officially there was no offensive interest for, from the EU, but was really framing this development uh, rhetoric. Uh, now, of course, there were some other considerations. One was that the ACP countries uh, already had uh, a very substantial uh, market access, preferential market access to the EU under the Lomé conventions and then uh, part of the Cotonou Agreement. Uh, and also that there was uh, a need not to, uh, perception that it was a need to, to be compatible with the WTO rules and not to differentiate in an arbitrary manner towards the ACP countries uh, versus other developing countries. And so what is interesting is to try to, to look at, you know, all these kind of good intentions. What were the, we know that the, the negotiations <laughs> lasted very long and, and there's been a lot of up and down and, and, and not been necessarily easy and then creating a lot of tensions. So we were uh, looking at the experience of, you know, what is some of the limits of the EU approach in trying to, to reach that coherence. And uh, one of the elements is, of course, that among trade policies uh, that, uh, itself, um, um, between different instruments that the EU is using for its trade policy. Uh, the fact that in 2001, uh, the, the EU has uh, adopted the everything but arms that provide a duty quota free market access to, to all least developed countries, uh, at the, just before it started negotiations on free trade agreements with the ACP, uh, has created uh, a, a, an even uh, type of approach and leverage for the EU towards the ACP countries, because the ACP uh, countries that were least developed countries uh, did not need to conclude an, a free trade agreement with the EU in order to keep or maintain them and, or increase their market access to, to, to the EU. Uh, they could rely on everything but arms. Uh, whereas the non-LDC countries uh, would 
lose their preferential treatment under the ACP regime. And so needed, uh, if they wanted to keep a preferential market access, felt that they needed to, to conclude an FTA. So as the negotiations were also uh, conducted, not on a country by country basis, but, but with this notion that regional integration was very important, the negotiations were conducted on the regional groupings. Uh, the fact that the EU, uh, uh, sorry, the fact that some uh, countries within one region, some of the uh, were LDCs and others were non-LDCs, that created this kind of uh, imbalance that, that was there. It's also interesting that there was a, a, a lack of uh, a coherence, perhaps at the international level between the trade regimes adopted by the uh, key uh, uh, key uh, trade players, because while the EU was insisting on the need to have free trade agreements between uh, uh, developing countries and, and itself uh, in order to be uh, compatible with the w WTO, the US were uh, saying that they could be, uh, you know, they could provide uh, unilateral preferences under a WTO waiver, like they did in the case of uh, AGOA for, for Africa. There was also a perception that because the ACP started with, the, you know, having already pre preferential access to the to the EU, that entering into free trade agreements where the EU will seek uh, will, will obtain then better access to the uh, uh, to the ACP markets. Uh, that's the there was an asymmetry of the of the gains that could uh, result from, from the agreements. Uh, and that could be in favor of the EU. And, and in that sense, that's quite interesting because remember the EU started simply with a, a development, uh, you know, with a development argument. So saying that's what you need to do to help your own development. Yet the way it is perceived, and that's perhaps quite important, uh, that the perception does matter is that there was an asymmetry of the, of the gains. There was also, uh, of course, different gains for different countries within one regions that could also creates a divergence within the, the groupings. Uh, another interesting point is, is this notion that, uh, you know, you're making trade commitments to, to, to lock in reforms and, 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 and you know, that, that again was the idea to, to provide, uh, you know, better regulatory framework to, to reform your economy. Yet it was quite often perceived in, in many ACP countries that the policy space would be reduced for you know, pursuing industrialization. Uh, and, and another point was, of course, the issue, and, and we still see these kind of issues uh, today, uh, was the sequencing of whether you should have uh, EPAs uh, coming and a trade agreement to try to help build and, and support regional integration processes. That was the narrative from the EU uh, versus a narrative by, by some, for instance, of the African regional economic communities. And we could hear the same kind of narrative now in Africa with the African continental free trade agreements uh, that uh, you should first have your integration among developing countries. So first regional integration, and then only you, you know on which basis you can partner with, with the EU. Um, and so in that sense, you know, we see that trying to achieve coherence in spite of positive objectives is not necessarily uh, an, easy, uh, an easy bargain. Uh, and, and perhaps the, the two points I wanted to, to, to stress uh, here is, is the link between the, the trade negotiations and, and the development supports, uh, which were initially delinked and that became more more connected, and that's what I, I want to talk about. And the second one, the, the second dilemma and, and problems that the EU has faced is perhaps the, you know, the lack of uh, public recognition of its own public, uh, of its own economic interests uh, in, in the negotiations uh, in the, uh, with the ACP countries. So it was all framed in terms of we need to be compatible with WTO and we need to, uh, uh, to support development, but the EU would not recognize that they had uh, also interest, which I think is quite interestingly has, has changed a lot now in, in, in the way, for instance, the EU approaches its partnership with Africa, looking at a more balanced and equal uh, type of approach. So very briefly, uh, we, we look, and I don't have time to, 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 to expand uh, too much here, but the papers are, are available online. But, but we look at a, a structured approach that was taken in particular in West Africa uh, to, to support uh, uh, the, the trade, the implementation of the economic partnership agreement. Uh, and, and the link that was made. So the, uh, more broadly, the ACP were asking the EU to say, well, if you want us to make 
trade commitments, you know, that might be interesting for us, but there will be anyway uh, adjustment costs uh, due to, to the new uh, economic partnership agreement. And, and therefore, we need, at least in the short and medium uh, term, before we have the benefits of the EPA, we need to have adjustment support. And the EU was a bit reluctant, uh, as I was saying initially, said, well, you will we already provide uh, development cooperation. Uh, we, uh, we're not going to link uh, trade negotiations with, uh, explicitly with, the, uh, with development cooperation. Over time, their position has, has partly changed, and what they said is to say, well, if you have adjustment, uh, uh, if you have adjustment costs, can you tell us what will be these adjustment costs, and then we'll see how we will, uh, you know, we will try to respond to that. And what we have seen is, in fact, in in this process, is that uh, it led to to some help, I think, to to show in terms of politics. The, the politics was very important. That's the, the concern of the West Africans, uh, of the West African region was taken seriously by the, by the EU and the EU wanted to make an effort uh, in responding to it. But it led to a rather bureaucratic, technocratic type of uh, effort of identifying some of the needs. And in practice, uh, it did not match the, the capacity of the EU to respond collectively in terms of supports. There was no additional uh, uh, finance uh, available. So it was more an exercise of trying to earmark and, and identify what is already in the pipeline of what the EU and the member states were, could do. And most of the member states also do not have regional programs, only work with some countries. Uh, and so it was a try to more of a packaging uh, exercise to try to see well, how they could uh, uh, how they could respond. So while it helped to conclude uh, the negotiations, because uh, you know the West Africans could say, well, if we conclude negotiations, we will get support from the EU, and the EU could say, look, we help you uh, to implement these efforts in practice. And now, when we look also afterwards for for, for the implementation phase and it has rather led to a rather rigid structured type of uh, elements in place, either being forgotten then by uh, development by, by European donors, or sometimes even impeding some more flexibility and adjustment to, to the needs at the moment. So when we compare to what's happening in some other countries, and in that sense, it's interesting to look at uh, the, we looked at the experience of Botswana and, and, and Mauritius. So in Botswana, the, the approach has been much more consultative process. There was no binding commitments. Uh, it is based on, on domestic strategy and, and ownership and also better anchored in some kind of regional approaches. So it's more in this constant dialogue and open dialogue based that's the, the programming of the aids to support the uh, uh, SADC EPA in Botswana has taken place and that seems to have been more more effective and the same way in Mauritius uh, in Mauritius then there is uh, you know support by the EU also to structural reforms that Mauritius wanted to to undertake uh, and quite interestingly also uh, you know support and the social inclusion um, that came even before some of the economic reforms were, were to take place notably in the sugar sector that, that then became quite Quite exposed, so that could have smoothed, and you know that that seems to have smoothed the smoothened the process of adjustment in in Mauritius. But the key lesson here is is that in fact a trade agreement is no substitute for for domestic reform dynamics. Uh, that that it can partly uh, accompany what what the country wants to do, but it cannot be a driving force. And, and we see that quite quite clearly. And that though there is a connection between trade and development cooperation, this has to be really you know, done in a flexible manner, responding to, to the needs as they evolved and based on domestic incentives. And, and the last point, and that's what I would like to conclude, is that the, the EU also uh, has to be more vocal and recognize its own interests and not frame everything in, in development. So we look at two kind of di dimensions, and I'll, I'll conclude just with this, briefly with these two. One is the private sector engagements. Uh, and the EU is very interesting, in fact, for itself, has also very interesting uh, uh, programs and tools to promote, for instance, the, the, the trade and investments within the EU single markets for, uh, for uh, SMEs. Uh, and uh, so we look at the case of the Enterprise Europe Network, which is mainly, uh, which is mainly that objective and, and to try to promote innovation and sustainability within the single market. But interestingly, uh, 
uh, um, among these uh, SME networks and, and private sector networks, there is a, also window dimension for the external dam, uh, for for external partners and external dimension. Though it is a very small one, and and looking at uh, at this case, we found that there's really scope to expand that to try to have matchmaking between uh, European SMEs with uh, partner SMEs uh, around the world, uh, focusing also uh, you know there are criteria around sustainability and, and, and promoting this. And, and that is quite a, an attractive way and complementary manner to include both sustainability and environmental criteria uh, in, in the way you do this matchmaking. So you have this development that is broader, but it's based on, on trying to get business to, to, to business relationship. And that can also feed, like it does the internal market uh, approach that these networks help to feed the um, EU internal regulations, it could be used to feed much better on the trade uh, policies and trade regulations of uh, 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 that the EU wants to wants to engage in. And the last point is the same can be done on on on, on investments. Uh, there is much more uh, efforts uh, recently by the EU to promote uh, investments, uh, notably through, for instance, the external investment plan with with Europe and uh, with the Africa. Uh, and the neighboring countries, and, and that is foreseen in the next uh, uh, phase of the EU budget to, to be applied to uh, to foster to promote investment across the, the across the, the world uh, through uh, you know different type of uh, development finance, the role of development finance institutions, guarantees that are provided, uh, blended finance, and and these are ways that are very attractive to to try to be combined with the. Uh, with the trade uh, policy agenda, uh, but again, uh, these uh, uh, you know such kind of tools and such kind of approaches can be very effective if they are anchored and, and, and done in partnership with the with the countries. So it should not be just EU type of approaches, but it should help uh, build uh, you know EU uh, sorry uh, institutions and, and initiatives in the partner countries. Um, so basically, you have to be two to tango, and you, you cannot just come with your own your own tools and your own uh, approaches to try to impose to to others. But there is a strong connection uh, between the trade and investment promotion as well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bilal. Well, I want to thank first of all the presenters for these for wide ranging remarks as we we went across a, a wide spectrum of topics here, but focusing in on the topic. Um, I think we all kind of got a sense of how in each of these discrete areas, trade integration and trade pol policy, whether it is or is not uh, coherent with the EU or, or the EU's own internal um, agenda. And I wonder if some of the questioning that I would have um, could focus a little bit on that as well. But first, let me see if we have any questions from the audience. I will invite the audience to ask our knowledgeable panelists. Um, any questions that may have come up. But whilst I wait for them, um, I, I wanted to ask each of you to ponder a couple of, of well, one or two thoughts that I had coming out of your presentations. Um, first, Miklos, I was wondering if your trade similarity index has a broader um, sort of application or applicability beyond the EU um, because you were looking at, I guess, trade similarity within EU countries and could be used as a tool for negotiations between the EU and other countries. So the EU looking at now negotiating, for instance, with the US, um, you know, entering into more bespoke arrangements with, with certain regions and certain territories. Is there a utility that you see or index um, being in that negotiation. So I'll leave that with you. I think I asked Professor Bruce the question I had already, and so we can go back to that. Um, Dr. Dawar, um, so I've been doing a little bit of work on subsidies and subsidy regulations, and the absence of an institution to lead the charge on some of the transparency and notification um, issues that you highlighted is a problem because the, the WTO is not serving that role for all sorts of self-interested reasons. And you were speaking about how the, the members of the OECD are, are kind of reconceptualizing the agreement to, to ensure that there's an absence of scrutiny. So in, in that situation, 
I mean, where, which institution or what kind of arrangement, if it's not a, a new type of OECD arrangement, how are we going to get at some of the uh, regulation of export credits um, um, and export credit in a multilateral sense? And can the EU play a, a leading role, I would say, in, in doing that? And then finally, Dr. Bilal, you spoke about coherence um, within the EU and in some of the, especially um, between its developmental policies and the, the countries with which it's negotiating, especially in Africa. I wonder if you could think about coherence across the ACP in particular, um, and whether any of the research you're doing looks at that um, with a view to informing maybe some of the negotiations, forward-looking negotiations in the post cotonou context. So coherence, um, not just in, individually between the EU and the countries that are it's negotiating with, but whether we're learning any lessons about coherence across the border, the broader spectrum of ACP countries and how, how that might differ and how that might be the same and what is the EU policy underpinning that. So I wonder if, um, again, looking at the, the chat function, if there are no questions from the audience, can I ask, um, first of all, uh, Professor Corin to take a stab at my, my question? Well, thank you very much for the great question. I think indeed that is the broader motivation for this research. I do think that the specific index will have to be validated against the data and see if it is indeed usable. But that's our motivation is, is to think about under what, if you think about mm -hmm. it, and, and I haven't really thought about this in terms of ex ante when we sit down at a trade negotiation table. Um, but I think that that would be a great application. You know, there are countries with very diverse um, interests, economic interests and other interests. And, and at the end of the day, they have to come to a conclusion and, and that deal is going to represent some combination of their interests, but, but some members of the, of the EU in, in this case in particular are going to maybe diverge a little bit and, and you know, may, may be interested in less than full compliance. And, uh, and so that could be a great application. We are actually um, other members of the team uh, exploring investment, uh, constructing similar in indices for foreign direct investment and bilateral investment treaties, which are more bilateral yeah. in nature. Yeah. Um, so I think the general idea, we, we definitely want to push, push further. And that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. And I just wonder, because it's, it's raising the question in my mind anyway, of how you move from that kind of index and any of the findings you make based on that economic analysis to constructing a European wide policy, like which interests economically do you privilege in which sectoral negotiations that the EU is undertaking as a block as opposed to others. I don't know if the coherence discussion is very relevant from, you know, taking the economic indices and proxies that you're using and then defining a policy that may not always make economic sense based on the aggregate analysis of what, what the index is showing you. So that's, that's something that I wondered, you know, from the index to policy. Have you looked at that at all? Yeah, so that's definitely the long, long term goal. I would be hesitant to kind of make, make very definite recommendations based on the current status of the index. I focus on on this particular sector and that pair of countries because there might be something fishy there um, because it needs a lot lot more work but that's that's kind of the direction we, we would want to push it into. Thank you so much really interesting work. Um, Professor Bruce if I can go to you because you've had a longer time to ponder my question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, first, uh, thank you for the question. The other is that I forgot to mention that uh, what I was talking about is the result of a collaborative work with uh, Pal, uh, Tina Pal and uh, Franklin Maduko. Uh, and uh, so answering your question, uh, the uh, non-discrimination uh, policies of the uh, EU are always part uh, of this kind of uh, uh, arrangement. And uh, so, the gender aspect is uh, uh, high uh, on this list. So the, the, it is non-discrimination uh, uh, aspects. And, and it has effects on the books. 
uh, but not much on the ground. Uh, we didn't find uh, much uh, uh, on the ground. And, uh, and uh, the other thing is that, um, uh, and this is uh, linked to uh, uh, the things that I mentioned, that uh, textile. It's textile uh, uh, that uh, when you have textile, then you uh, uh, sh increase in the share of textile in the export, you see decrease in labor rights. And this is the sector where uh, 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 gender bias, it's, it's basically women, uh, or largest part of it, it's women. So whether this is due to uh, some cultural uh, things in Morocco or uh, just normally, uh, it's the low uh, asset specificity, like in Moldova, I, we have not explored this, but uh, for sure uh, uh, that plays a role. So th this is this is uh, this is gendered, but it has behind that, that there are uh, uh, my hunch. I'm more economic socialist uh, perspective. Uh, uh, strong economic reasons why uh, on the ground we don't see much change. And Professor, you mentioned in your presentation that the EU seems to be sidelining labor. Um, as a sort of a negotiating priority and kind of relegating it more to the human rights context, which, um, you know, is an interesting development. Doesn't that contrast with sort of how the U.S. seems to be integrating labor into its agreement, increasingly having um, enforceable provisions that we're seeing under, for instance, CAFTA um, on labor and labor rights that can actually be brought to dispute settlement or whatever kind of um, dispute settlement facility they have. So there isn't there, a, in terms of the coherence piece again, mm -hmm. uh, there is a lack of coherence in the approach of some of the developed countries towards the inclusion of labor rights in their, at least as, as, a, as a matter of negotiating emphasis and priority. Yeah, and it's a very good question, I, I, because uh, on the U.S. side and after side, what you see the activation of uh, the California effect uh, or the race to the top uh, by the unions uh, uh, and uh, the Congress. Uh, so it means that they uh, basically made on, uh, based on uh, narratives on unfair competition, they push up uh, standards and, and push for enforcement. If you look at, uh, 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 again, there we see uh, the problem of, of low or high-end rights. But I try to make this distinction uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, puts pressure on Mexico to implement these kind of uh, uh, elementary labor standards. First of all, and, and their trade union rights are very important. Uh, but uh, not much uh, on, on those that might force uh, firms to invest more into labor. And there, is a, there are very good studies uh, actually uh, by the Watson Institute uh, uh, and Andrew Schrank uh, wrote very interesting thing comparing, for example, uh, 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 Central American countries, uh, how they implement this kind of rules uh, and uh, Mexico. In the EU, that kind of pressure is absent uh, meaning this domestic or intra-EU uh, uh, forces like trade unions uh, don't see uh, a major competitor in uh, the eastern neighborhood or in, in the Mediterranean. So th this, this kind of pressure is, uh, is weak. Uh, so I, I think that that's that how far we can go now. Uh, uh, that kind of mechanism uh, has to be set in motion by actors uh, within the uh, countries or, or regions with higher standards, and that is absent in EU. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot with my question. Um, <laughs> Dr. Nope. Dawar, <laughs> yes. Dr. Dawar, I wonder if you've had some time to think about my difficult question on on how we get this. Um, is Dr. Duar, Dr. Your, 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 unfortunately, your, your video seems to be frozen. Can you hear? Okay, it may be that we have a little technical. Oh, can you hear us? The picture is frozen. Yes, your picture might be frozen. At least I'm not seeing you moving, but can you speak? Yes, this is a little bit better. Can you hear? Okay, so whilst we sort that out, maybe we can jump ahead 
because I think we've lost connection with Dr. Dewar, so hopefully she'll join us. Um, but Dr. Bilal, I think, I think you can take the question I asked. Yes, I will. Uh, but, but since I, I was hoping to be able to, to, to follow up on, on Kamala, because in fact, the question you, you ask her is quite interesting also in terms of development. So I let her answer on, on the export credit agencies, but she mentioned that there were more and more tools that were, that were used and more and more means to, to support uh, uh, trade and investments. And, and I find that the, um, you know, the transparency in terms of uh, of development objectives, uh, there is this notion that you need to support the uh, private sector in advanced economies to go into developing countries because it's a more risky environment, it's more difficult and so on, and also because it could have a very strong uh, development impact. And when there is a, a feeling that the market forces are not sufficient, uh, then there's a use of, uh, you know, what would be subsidies, but that's not really the way they, they call it. They say, well, it's private sector support and engagement is blended finance, um, but, but blended finance, this mix of, uh, of, of uh, development cooperation or development money with the private, uh, to leverage private finance is, is in direct way of, of subsidizing. And there's a question of whether, for instance, what the EU is, is trying to do is really you know, compatible with the principles of state aid, which, uh, you know, would not be in the context of, uh, of, of what would be done within the internal market. And uh, there is also the, the development finance institutions are found are very agile in, in talking about the, you know, not distorting the markets. So talking about market forces when they find it convenient uh, for them or, or, you know, for, for, for their approach. And when we use, in particular, in the case of blended finance, then to say, well, we can intervene because there are weaknesses in the market and, and, and therefore, you know, this is a good justification. But how much you, how much you can do that and how much you can uh, distort that, I think Simon Evnett also has been, you know, having interesting reflection on that, uh, is, is, I find that, you know, we're in a, in a blurred type of, uh, of area. We use the rhetoric that we find it convenient, either market forces or development support whenever we, we want to. Uh, but you asked me a question on, on coherence, uh, I want to be short, but on coherence among the ACP. Well, maybe, maybe because we have Dr. Dewar, maybe because we now That'd given be her more to consider, <laughs> because of your, your great intervention, I wonder if I can just ask Dewar, Dr. Dewar to take it before we turn to you. Sure. Sure. Um, can I hope that you can hear me loud and clear now. Yes. Actually, it's very good that uh, San came on before me because he brought up something I wanted to talk about. So your question was really about how can we resolve this problem? Um, so if we look at the institutions, we can say, well, the OECD has a problem. It's kind of like a cartel of the old established rich countries. And it's, the arrangement is only open by invitation. So I think that's a problem. They invite China, China says no. Brazil wants to join, America says no. So immediately you have this uh, kind of like strange cartelized situation with the OECD. Um, and so that's why it's becoming less relevant. Then we know that we have a problem with the WTO, particularly because of matching. It's when you can match an offer from another ECA, uh, but nobody knows what it is and that's non-compliant. And the WTO really doesn't know how to deal with that because of transparency and lack of detailed uh, measures. So we have this new initiative called the International Working Group on Export Credit Support, which was kicked off in 2012. Um, and that was doing okay, I think, until the trade war. So actually the problem with the trade war is it's created some sort of conflict. It's made unilateral, um, well, just a subsidy war creates a problem for unilateral reform, because if everybody else is doing it, why would I not do it? Because I'm going to lose out competitiveness. So we have that issue. Where you could really step in here is this concept of additionality. And this is what uh, actually segs well with what San was saying. So an export credit agency should only really offer something that's not available on the commercial market. And so there is this concept that they have to add additionality. There have to be something that's not there. Now, the trouble is additionality. How do we know? Everything is so non-transparent. How can I possibly say that that wasn't available on the commercial market? Um, and if I could, I could only find out about it ex uh, after, post facto, and then it's gone. The, trans the transaction has happened. Uh, 
So um, the EU could actually kick in and start talking more about how do you, how do you assess additionality? Um, how can we make sure that there is additionality and not state aid? Uh, the other strange thing about the EU is that medium to long-term export credit support doesn't, is not covered by the state aid rules. Short term is, not medium to long term, because they assume it complies with the OECD. Whereas we know the OECD is shrinking in relevance and scope. So why is the EU relying on the OECD to, to ensure compliance of what is actually hard rules because they've transposed it into the acquis. They're still letting uh, a soft law institution uh, govern these rules that are actually binding within the EU. So it's actually very interesting how the EU doesn't quite know what to do because it cannot say we want you all to tie your hands behind your back and then you're not going to be competitive at all with anybody outside the EU. And yet it has Germany throwing an awful lot of money at this as compared to a country like Cyprus, it throws no money at this. Um, so the EU is actually in a very strange position because it wants a level playing field and there is not one internationally or within the internal market. So uh, I think that actually this concept of additionality has to come forward and we have to prove additionality. Excellent. Well, talk about the lack of coherence <laughs> internally as well as externally. So thank you for these um, reflections. Excellent. Thank you. And within the next three minutes, unfortunately, um, Dr. Bilal, um, can I ask you to just um, go with whichever question <laughs> you like? like well, just on, one, but yeah. Thank you very much. Just on the question of additionality, if you take additionality in terms of development impact, that even makes it a, a bigger question because you could have export credits that is provided by the private markets, but then at a price that, that makes it so quite uncompetitive or restricted to, to only some type of companies that, that would afford it. And, and if you want to provide an additional incentive because you think there's a development impact connected to that, uh, and, and that becomes a notion of additionality that is very important in the way uh, uh, development finance is, is working. Uh, but that is very difficult to measure. I, I want to get back to, to just the issue of uh, coherence of the ACP. I mean, most our work has been focused, the entry point has been on the coherence of the EU side. I think there's been a lot of efforts of coherence of the ACP uh, uh, from the ACP side, uh, trying to coordinate and so on. So uh, I don't want to undermine at all these, these efforts and there was a lot of learning by doing. But I think the, the experience of negotiating with the EU has shown that negotiating as a regional group Grouping is something very difficult. Uh, you have different capacities and, and different interests as, as a region um, uh, among the member states. So you find these tensions between the members of, of one regional grouping. You have different interests and so on. They have to coordinate. You have weak capacity to, to do it in the Caribbean. Uh, they, they did it rather well with the Caribbean uh, regional negotiation, negotiation uh, machinery. But uh, nevertheless, the, the you have this imbalance, but you also have tensions between what is done at the regional or uh, at the regional organization or regional level and what the member states want to do. And you see that in particular when you provide support uh, in terms of development. There's a common interest to, to get more support at the regional level, but yet <clears throat> if a country can get support directly at the national level, they would prefer it than to be given to another entity at the regional level. So, so you have this multi-level of governance that makes it quite, uh, quite tricky uh, in, in that sense. And the last point is that I think there was definitely the misperceptions both from the ACP negotiating with the EU and, and internally is that negotiating with the EU, they thought the EU was a unified actor and so I remember having discussions with negotiators and they didn't really care how was the machinery of the EU. Well, it makes a lot of difference to whom you're talking to, member states or Digitrade or which, which part of the commission you're talking to does make a difference. Uh, but also internally, a lot of these uh, negotiations, you know, they, there's a traditional view that uh, negotiations on trade have to be done by, led by the Minister of Trade, uh, while it touches on so many other issues. And so I think if you want to have coherence, you have to, to, to try to look at the whole of the, of the government type of approach. And Minister of Finance, Ministry you know, to follow Laszlo's approach, Ministry of Labor, and so a lot of different ministries have to be able to, to come together to, to have some kind of uh, common position. So that's, uh, you know, perhaps one of the lessons uh, that we also learned from, from these efforts. Excellent, and that's a nice coherent point to sort of end us off on. We are bang on time, 
at 9.30, well, 9.30 for me, it's 3.30, I imagine, for you. This has been an excellent, for me anyway, very enlightening session. Um, all that leaves for me to do is to thank the organizers, um, the EUI, Professor Huckman, who's joined us, as well as the participants who made it, um, you know, part of their day's deliberations to listen to this. And of course, to my panelists, Professors Cloran and Professor Bruce and Dr. Bilal and Dr. Dawari, your um, interventions have been absolutely wonderful and we look forward to reading more about them. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us and I hope to see you guys at other sessions. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.